Okay, hello and welcome to another episode of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa Whitecross, zooming to all of you from Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, South Africa has moved to adjusted level three, so I hope that you've had a chance to restock and pour yourself a glass of your favorite drink ahead of tonight's show. The Olympics are also in full swing, and it has brought a welcome distraction to our lockdown restrictions. We wish all of the athletes well as they represent their countries and go for gold. And a big congratulations to Tatiana Schoonmaker, who put South Africa officially onto the medals table this morning with her silver in the women's 100 meter breaststroke. Well done, Tatiana. Now, tonight, we will have our final talk in the Biodiversity Stewardship Series and look forward to hearing all about the conservation work going into protecting South Africa's estuaries on the East and West Coast. Our experts this evening are Dr. Giselle Merrison and Nicolette Forbes. But before we introduce tonight's presenters, please remember that you, our audience, can communicate with us using the Zoom chat room and questions for our speakers can be posted into the Q&A box throughout the webinar. If you're watching us on Facebook Live or the conservation uh, conversation stream to our virtual African Bird Fair platform, you can use the respective chat feeds on those different platforms to comment and ask questions as well. We'll answer these at the end of the webinar. Now, if you'd like to get in touch via our social media channels, please use the hashtag Conservation Conversations. All of our previous episodes are available on BirdLife South Africa's YouTube channel, as well as our podcast. We'd like to thank all, we'd like to ask all of you to please subscribe to our YouTube channel to help us grow support for this video content. We are very close to that 1000 subscriber mark. So please help us cross that threshold. If you're enjoying the series and can afford to support it financially, every little bit helps us to keep these webinars free for all to learn and enjoy. Simply scan the Cricut QR code on screen or visit our Conservation Conversations website to find the link to the don donations tab. Now a big thank you to everyone who has donated so far, especially during these difficult economic times. It is greatly appreciated. The Virtual African Bird Fair is upon us and will go live this Friday at four o'clock. Registrations are open and tickets to watch our keynote lectures by Chris Packham, the UK-based conservation television presenter, and David Lindo, the urban birder, are still on offer. You can also book your spot to participate in any of the three workshops on offer, covering birding basics, an in-depth look at birds of prey, or bird photography masterclass with Albert Froneman. All you have to do is visit the eventmobi.com slash birdfair website to register for your free access to the many incredible talks and exhibitors and sponsor booths that are on offer. But to tell you why you should join, here is the urban birder himself, Mr. David Lindo. Hello there, I'm David Lindo and I'm also known as the urban birder. Now, I'll be one of the keynote speakers at the virtual African bird fair on the 30th to 31st of July, 2021, alongside my really good friend, Chris Packham. It's gonna be a great event. So why don't you register to attend? Thank you, David, for that snippet. And I think you should take heed of what he said and join us on Friday and Saturday. It certainly is going to be a hell of a lot of fun. It now gives me great pleasure to welcome BirdLife South Africa's Western Cape Estuaries Project Manager, Dr. Giselle Merrison, and Marine and Estuarine Researchers, Nicolette Forbes, to Conservation Conversations tonight. Giselle is re responsible for facilitating improved protection and appropriate management of priority estuaries within IBAs and KBAs in the Western Cape, in partnership with government organizations, other MPOs, and local stakeholders. This includes relevant policy input and support and the initiation, implementation and support of conservation initiatives to benefit estuarine ecosystem health, including habitat management and rehabilitation projects, such as alien clearing, salt marsh restoration and fainbos management, as well as environmental awareness and education and scientific research and monitoring, which is key in these estuarine KBAs. Giselle joined BirdLife South Africa in 2015 after working as a researcher with the RSPB and as biodiversity coordinator for West Yorkshire for several years. She completed her undergraduate and postgraduate degrees at the University of Cape Town with the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology. She achieved her PhD in ecology and environmental management in 2007 through the University of East Anglia in Norwich, 
with a focus on the impacts of recreational disturbance, urbanization, and fragmentation on heathland birds. Giselle is also an avid birder, frogger, hiker, and scuba diver. Now joining Giselle tonight is a familiar face to the Conservation Conversations community, Nicolette Forbes, who was recently one of our esteemed OWL Award recipients. Nicolette is an estuary ecologist with MER, having started her career in 1992 as a lecturer at the University of Natal, Durban, beginning her research career working with mangroves in the estuaries of KZN, her perspective shifted to the broader environment in which the mangroves were growing, and her work over the last 27 years has been focused on the investigations at the coast with a strong focus on estuary function, management, and restoration. This work has covered specialist input into legal disputes, oil spills, inappropriate development and exploitation, and restoration in coastal and marine environments. Over a decade ago, her work was recognized by the Wildlife and Environment Society of South Africa, who selected her for the Conservationist of the Year Award in 2007. Her experience has seen this accumulated research with KwaZulu-Natal coastal zone habitats culminate in her lead as the project coordinator of the country's largest restoration project within the Isimangaliso Wetland Park, South Africa's first World Heritage Site. This work focused on restoring key processes to this important coastal area to initiate changes in landscape level function. This work has been presented internationally in Brazil, Bangladesh, and the USA. More recently, Nicolette and her colleague Bronwyn James of Isimangaliso were selected as the winners of the 2017 National Wetland Award for Research and Science, which recognizes people who have made a significant contribution towards wetland scientific research, providing a sound basis for informed management actions which strengthen water security. My goodness, we certainly are in very capable hands this evening. Giselle, Nicolette, thank you so much for joining us tonight as we embark on this exciting journey looking into South Africa's estuaries and what's being done to preserve them. So I'm gonna hand over to the two of you to take it away and a very good evening to you both. Thanks very much, Melissa, for that lovely introduction. And thank you, Giselle. Um, for inviting me to be part of your presentation. Do you want me to kick off? Okay. Hopefully you can all see my screen. We can, thanks Nikki. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to start on the east coast of South Africa and try and give you a bit of an overview of estuaries, how they function, and a little bit about what we can do to start making a difference to all our estuaries without drilling into too much detail. And then I'm gonna leave Giselle to speak to you about some very specific estuaries and about the work that, the wonderful work that BirdLife South Africa is starting to do to try and help us turn around the trajectory of change on all of these systems, particularly obviously with a focus on the birds. So I'm going to start off by zooming out a little and starting with KZN, which as many of you know, and I know there are a lot of people from KZN online, but we've also got a lot of international people. The KZN coastline is about 500 Ks and stretches from that border of Mozambique, which you can see up at the top there, um, down to the Eastern Cape boundary. I'm just gonna put a pointer on just in case I need it. There we go. So we're looking at this area that's highlighted, the little red blotches you can see are the estuaries along our coastline. And we have 75 estuaries along the KZN coast. There are 300 in total in South Africa. So you can see KZN is pretty well endowed with those systems, having more estuaries um, per kilometer, linear kilometer along the coast than any of the other provinces. And that is a result of our very steep coastline our seasonal summer rainfall and very erodible um, geology. So we have many small systems quite close together along our coast. That high density of rivers, and if you take it on average, particularly south of the Tugela River, we have one estuary every 3.6 kilometers of coastline. And what that does, for those of you who are familiar with wetlands and those sorts of areas, is that it really precludes the formation of many non-riverine linked wetlands. So what we have are wetlands that are basically associated with the main river basins and associated with estuaries. So that makes each and every one of these estuaries quite vital. And it's a, a, a probably a biased opinion, but I hope 
that by the end of this, I will have convinced you how vital. If I look at what an estuary is, and again, this is a definition that is, I think, important because estuaries around the world vary quite markedly in terms of the way that they behave, depending on the coastline, the sand movement along the coast, the wave action. So you can see that definition there is the one that has been accepted and was accepted at the Rio Convention in 1992 and was changed to actually incorporate some of the features of South African estuaries which had previously been ignored. One of those being that our estuaries do open and close periodically um, to the sea. So they may become isolated from the sea by a sandbar, as you can see in this um, picture in the background. And during that time, you have quite a lot of change that happens in these systems. Some of them become very fresh, particularly many of our smaller estuaries on the KZN coast, while others like the bigger Lake St. Lucia, which I see many people in the chat room have, have also visited, may become hypersaline. The most important thing that you could take out of that definition, obviously being that fresh water meets seawater at the coast, is the fact that these are very dynamic and very movable systems. And that is something that in the history of management of our estuaries and interventions around our estuaries, people have tried to change. That changeability and dynamism is one of the most important things to keep intact for these systems. So estuaries do come in, in lots of different shapes and sizes. So we've got one word that covers a whole spectrum of different types, different categories of estuaries. And I've got the five uh, South African categories up there, estuarine bays, estuarine lakes, permanently open estuaries, river mouth estuaries, and intermittently open estuaries. And I've marked along the KZN coast those different types by color. And what should be immediately apparent from that line is that we have very few estuarine bays, and we only actually have Richards Bay and Durban Bay. There's only three in the country. We have also very few estuarine lakes, all of them being contained up in the north, north of the Tugela, and three of them within the Isamangalisa Wetland Park. We have also only a few river mouth estuaries, and the majority of those, and you can see the numbers in the bar graph here, the majority of our estuaries sit in this category of intermittently open estuaries. And that has quite a lot of bearing on the ways in which they behave, what occurs within them, and how we need to interact with them in terms of managing human impacts and activities. If we look at the water birds, because that's obviously one of the major points of focus for tonight, there are three broad groups in estuaries. And those groups have very wide habitat requirements which need to be satisfied, including breeding, feeding, and the roosting. So we have a, a community of water birds that changes as well seasonally, but incorporates all of those different um, categories. A summer community, which is dominated by the Paleoarctic migrants, as everybody would expect, which obviously come into our estuaries during their non-breeding phase mostly, for feeding, a winter community which has resident water birds which will roost and feed in those estuaries. Some of them will also um, nest in those systems during summer, some in winter. And then roosting species, forage on the coast or at sea and come into estuaries to roost. So those species that only come into the estuaries after their day has ended or start off their day from there. What that should have painted a picture of is a bird community that is very diverse. It's diverse from a taxonomic perspective. It's diverse in the, in the ways in which the birds function and interact with estuaries and morphologically. So you have from very small individuals to very large ones with all sorts of adaptations and things in between. That high ta taxonomic diversity that you find in an estuary relates to the, the variety of habitats that you get. So you have everything from salt marshes, reed beds, sandbanks, intertidal sandbanks, water bodies for the birds that swim and dive, you have mangroves. So all of those different things bring something to the table when it comes down to the bird water bird community. There's also a significant seasonal fluctuation, as I already mentioned, because a significant number of our water birds come in in summer as Paleoarctic migrants. 
And that obviously changes the picture and makes the whole thing quite exciting to, to follow through, through the different seasons. Estuaries are very dynamic, as I mentioned, when we looked at that definition. And what that can do is complicate those patterns, those seasonal patterns that you see. So depending, if you're just focusing on one particular estuary, you may see differences from season to season, from summer to summer. And that will relate to the fact that the estuary is maybe responding very differently to its major drivers. Human disturbance on top of that also adds a further level of, of difficulty to the choices that birds have available when they want to use these systems. And that's something to just bear in mind. We've got 162 species which occur regularly in our South African estuaries and that's of water birds. That number does fluctuate depending on what you use and who you speak to and who you use. Um, that's Phil Hockey's number and what I'd like to do here is also just acknowledge that a lot of what we know and understand about our water birds using estuaries and the way, ways in which they use estuaries, feed and everything else has come from much of the work that the wonderful late Phil Hockey did um, in our estuaries. So some of what I report tonight is still from the, from the work that he has done. The significance of estuaries in South Africa is obviously, as I mentioned, those migratory waders come down to visit our estuaries in the non-breeding phase. So during our summer and Although we have many estuaries, I mentioned 300, they are quite small systems and actually are, are they pale in comparison with some of the sizes of European and Asian estuaries and some of the coastal wetland, wetlands. However, we do have um, incredible densities of waders in our estuaries, higher than any in the other non-breeding areas that they visit in their range. So any of the non-breeding areas to the north of us actually have much lower densities of waders. So the low overall numbers that we get of paleotic migrants are just an expression of the size of the available habitat we have because we don't have super huge estuaries. But those densities make the functioning and the protection of these estuaries quite important. So as I said, that density increases. So the carrying capacity per unit of area of estuary increases from north to south. So as those birds are moving and migrating down south, the push is to get down to those southern systems that Giselle is going to talk to you about because there are many more of those migrants that can be conserved per unit area because of the incredible carrying capacities there. Um, then any of the systems further north. So the loss of even small areas of our estuarine habitats will impact greater numbers of birds than the loss of an equivalent area further north. And again, this speaks to the importance of us having to, to look after them. Why might there be the productivity and the diversity that you do get in estuaries? And a lot of it relates to this life cycle you can see in front of you, which um, I'm not going to go through. But what it does do is it links the sea with these estuaries very intricately. There are a number of species that have to come into estuaries as part of their life cycle. The ones you can see on that particular slide, spotted grunter, stump nose and prawns, all have to reach an estuary to fulfill a part of their life cycle or it's the end of the line. That um, life cycle and their presence in the estuaries during that time is what makes it what we've called there the ultimate takeaway. Because at the time that these animals are all growing up and spending their nursery time in the estuary, it's a wonderful takeaway for everything else that needs to move food resources out, including these fish who come and feed and then move back out to sea. So the estuary is a, a, gets a net loss of any of those nutrients and energy that is produced in these systems. The same is true for the birds. It is the ultimate takeaway and we have a whole range of trophic gills that interact with estuaries from swimming, aerial, and wading piscivores, the invertebrate feeders, which we've mentioned in terms of the paleotic migrants, but we have quite a few of the resident species that will also um, feed on invertebrates. 
aquatic plant feeders and others that are dependent on aquatic plants and that are tied to these systems because of that. And then a few other outliers, some of the things like um, the flamingos who feed on plankton and invertebrates, but also require these systems to be functioning and producing. So the takeaway and the productivity of these systems is incredibly vital to the whole functioning of the coast. If we have a look at what state our subtropical estuaries are in, and by subtropical, I'm looking at everything from Cozy Bay at that um, Mozambique border, all the way into the Eastern Cape to the Bashi estuary. And if you have a look, you can see that we're not doing so well on a scale starting from the most pristine systems at an A through to an F, um, our extremely degraded systems. If you look at the graph, you can see the Isamangaliso system. So Cozy Bay and Gobaseleni and St. Lucia have been removed from this calculation. They're so large that they would swamp the area calculation. But you can see that for all the other systems, the other 72, we are sitting with most of them in a D category and moving through to an E. And that has slid even further with this latest uh, national biodiversity assessment. So what can we do to start turning that around? And I believe that there are things we can do. Let's look at what drives that degradation first. And there's a number of big hitters here on this slide. So artificial mouth manipulation. Have anybody seen bulldozers and people digging and interfering with the mouth of an estuary? It used to be just opening. Now sometimes it's closing as well. Habitat loss and transformation of the estuary within its estuarine boundaries. And I'm going to talk to you about estuarine boundaries just after this. Water quantity changes. So an estuary receiving less water than it gets in its natural state or more water can both have a very pr profound effect on estuarine health. And then water quality, which is a biggie at the bottom, resulting in fish kills, resulting in, like on this middle slide, the proliferation of alien invasive aquatic plants all over the surface, and then sometimes the inappropriate treatment of those same plants leading to further impacts to the estuary because that particular sign is being treated, not the cause of, of that condition. So what is important, I think, and I've painted a picture of the estuaries along the coast, is that the effective conservation of our estuaries requires a network. We need to have breeding, non-breeding, and staging sites in a very linked network, particularly down, I'm talking about the east coast here, where we have a migratory pathway that feeds a lot of the migrants through down the stepping stones of the estuary in, in KZN through to the Eastern Cape and then down to the Western Cape where Giselle is going to be speaking about the wonderful volumes of migratory waders that you get through there, I'm sure. So what can we do? And one of the first things I'd like to highlight is the protection of estuary boundaries and buffers. And if people are not familiar with this, estuary boundaries are, are defined in law and they're defined to be a certain level topographic contour or as determined by the habitats and the conditions around an estuary. And if you look at the picture here, the, the estuary on the left is one in which has its estuarine boundary, which is known as the estuarine functional zone, highlighted. And within that estuarine functional zone, you can see there's a lot of development. There's not much of estuary left there. Whereas the estuary on the right, the EFZ is indicated again by this blue line, the, the boundary of the estuary. But within that, there has been basically natural habitats that have been allowed to remain. And I think it doesn't take much to understand that those different estuary conditions will extend or reduce the number of habitats. It's going to influence estuary health, integrity, and will produce the value and knock on to the number of species you find there. The types of habitats you get off channel, and this is the main channel in this estuary here, the types of habitats you get off channel there are completely different from what you get in this main, the main um, river course. So you are obviously going to have very different plants occurring here, different specific habitats, and the different species will then follow that. One of the wonderful 
um, estuaries that I want to mention, if somebody wants to go and look at estuaries that have their boundaries intact and are still producing the types of habitats that we see within those boundaries, the Amatikulu estuary on the north coast is one of them. And in the picture there is Mr. Junior Gabela, who is one of the bird life um, trained bird guides. And Junior has also assisted us on many field trips. So he knows quite a bit about estuaries and estuary methods in terms of assessment. And he provides tours of this estuary. So you can go and explore some of these habitats and see how different they are from maybe some of the local urban estuaries that lie around us. There's also a wonderful estuary to the south, which is the one that was in this picture here, the Umzimbazi, which lies near Karadin. So for those of you that are closer to the south of Durban, you could visit that one and marvel at what there is. These are our biodiversity hotspots with, along our KZN coast. Whoops, sorry. So if I have to focus on what might be some take home messages from some of the, the limited information I've shown you, there are two quick wins for significant increases in estuary function and to provide the types of habitats that attract the food resources and from the food resources to the birds. And the first one is to protect that estuary functional zone, which I've just shown you and explained to you and prevent transformation of the existing habitats that lie within those. I think equally important, if we want to start reversing the trend that I showed you on that graph, is in tandem to do what we can to enhance habitats where there's already been reversal. So we can take places that are shown like in the left here of the slide, an estuary very close to Durban, we won't name and shame at the moment, to habitats that look like that and are much more productive, rich and working for our all sorts of things from biodiversity to climate change adaptations. The second quick win would be to start focusing a lot more on water quality. We need to be thinking constantly of the catchment effect. Don't forget these estuaries are draining, are doing land-based drainage coming into them from all sorts of directions and places and they're going to get everything from the catchment with accumulation in many of our intermittently open estuaries which are quite small so they are very easily influenced and excess nutrients is one of the the biggies that's starting to to crop up all up and down our coast and by nutrients we're talking nitrates and phosphates so we're not talking about failing sewage works necessarily here we're just talking about the products that come out of even a, a well working sewage works which is like fertilizer nitrates and phosphates if we had to just provide a little bit of focus on those two things, I firmly believe we can start changing the direction of many of our, our estuaries that are degrading at a terrific pace at the moment. So I see that we have two options. One is non-aspirational. We're on a downwards trajectory at the moment with all round devastating consequences, not only for estuaries, but for the fish that utilize them, the invertebrates, the crabs, the all sorts of um, prawns, those sorts of animals, right up to the birds and the higher trophic levels. Or we can improve estuary health and begin real actions of restoration in a serious way on the ground. No more paper pushing, some real change on the ground, which I think you're going to hear a bit more about in the second half of this. We have entered the UN decade of ecosystem restoration, 2021 to 2030, so I think this would be a great time to, to get quite serious. And so I want to leave you with a thought that Robert Frost's lovely quote that everybody knows, um, which path are we going to take that would make the difference to these estuaries? And I hope that the path you choose will lead you to an estuary full of birds. And I'll hand over to Giselle to carry on with the Western Cape. Thanks, Giselle. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thanks, Nikki. That's it. Excellent presentation. Um, really enjoyed that. And I was learning a great deal from that as well. So thank you so much for joining, uh, uh, joining me this evening on this presentation. I'm going to share my screen now, see if I can get started. So as uh, Nikki mentioned, um, I'm going to take a closer look at one or two examples of our estuaries on the west and south coasts in the Western Cape. 
and then go into a little bit more detail about the kind of work that BirdLife South Africa is doing um, in the estuarine space, a lot of on the ground work. So I have already seen from the chat room that there are a number of people tuning in from the West Coast and our, and our Berg River Estuary. So that's fantastic. Um, and pictured here is the Berg River Estuary floodplain in spring, an absolutely beautiful sight. Um, but along the West Coast in particular, these estuarine systems actually stand out as being the only intact ecological corridors in an otherwise rather transformed landscape, transformed by agriculture, development, mining, um, a number of different factors. And pictured here is the Berg River estuary in that blue, that's the estuarine functional zone. And then the light green is the intact um, high biodiversity habitat um, in the surrounding areas. So you can see how much of the landscape is transformed. And the Berg is a big system. It's approximately 8,000 hectares in extent, which puts it only second to St. Lucia in South Africa. And it encompasses around 60% of the estuarine habitat on the West Coast. So that's a big system in comparison to other systems um, in South Africa. And it's classified as a predominantly open system, but it is in fact permanently open because its mouth is stabilized by concrete backards and it's dredged um, on a regular basis. So it's a permanently open system. It's ranked third in the country for its conservation importance, unsurprising to anyone who's visited it. And it has a major diverse, diversity of major habitat types, all the way from your commercial salt works, which you see as you drive into felt drift, the intertidal mud flats, the open pans out in the floodplain, the salt marsh or sage marsh, or halophytic and xeric floodplain, and all the reed marsh in the area as well. It's hugely valued for its biodiversity and particularly its bird life. And as Nicolette mentioned, those important staging areas and feeding areas for our migratory birds in particular. And it's also valued, of course, as a nursery area for angling and commercially important fish species, which support local livelihoods as well as wider marine fisheries. So this is just a lovely picture of some of the vegetation types and bird that we see, good bird communities that we see at the Berg. And there are more than 250 species of bird recorded from um, the Berg River Airstream Important Bird and Biodiversity Area, 127 of which are water birds. And that's actually also from the late um, Phil Hockey, who provided that information um, a long time ago, and it's holding steady to this day. Um, in the past, it has regularly supported more than 20,000 uh, water birds. These are non pasturine water birds, and obviously that is tremendously influenced by the influx of Paleoarctic migrants to the system. The berg, in fact, has the highest recorded density of waders on the East Atlantic seaboard, which um, was recorded from the plant mud flat um, at the berg. So that's that high density that Nikki was referring to. It has good numbers of greater and lesser flamingo, and of course, the commercial salt works support those breeding, important breeding populations of species like Caspian tern and chestnut banded plover. One of the real special uh, uh, bird congregations at the Berg River Estuary are the Cape Cormorant that um, are endangered Cape Cormorant that come into roost at the commercial salt works in the evening. And sometimes during the year, it's in their tens of thousands that they come into roost. And another wonderful feature of the berg is up in the upper estuary, there's a Cass, the Cass Fontaine heronry, which is a 300 year old heronry, which supports thousands of birds of at least 13 different species. So these are one of some of the many facets of the berg communities and the vegetation types that make up the berg. Um, and it's not surprising then that it is unique in its diversity, both in the bird and its, habit, um, its habitat and its bird makeup. So the berg is very important for supporting salt marsh in the country. It's got the largest area of salt marsh in South Africa, uh, around 4,400 hectares. And this is important as well for other ecosystem services because tidal salt marsh, like your seagrass and your mangroves, sequesters and stores significant amounts of coastal blue carbon. 
so it's recognized for its role in mitigating climate change. It has the second highest area of reed marsh in the country, extensive floodplains, and these are incredible habitats which make it incredibly unique. But unfortunately, the habitats that I'm talking about are threatened by drought, um, reduced freshwater inflow and quality, particularly around pollution of its inflow, and also encroaching agricultural activity. And I think we've really seen some really uh, the worst of this now in the recent drought and the effects that's had on the Berg River estuary. In a recent study now of the valuation of the Berg River estuary, which was con um, undertaken by the Department of Environmental Affairs and Development Planning, um, they um, have found now that the estuary now receives less than half of its mean annual runoff and has lost most of its freshwater summer flow. And that's due to over extraction, those in channel infrastructure of dams, and of course, lower rainfall with climate change. And in addition to this, there's also significantly reduced flooding in winter. And all this has an effect on habitat types, which of course are dependent on the different salinity levels and those flooding regimes. And the situation with the birds is actually also incredibly worrying. Um, again, in this uh, recent study, um, which was undertaken by um, Oricon and Zutari, they looked at um, the coordinated water bird count data for the estuary. And this revealed an exponential decline in the number of water birds since 1994. So bird numbers estimated in re recent counts are only at 34% of the numbers recorded back in 1994. And this result is actually reflected nationally. Um, with recent counts only 30, around 32% of the numbers recorded in the baseline counts, which were mostly from the 1970s and 1980s. So these decreases have been by far the highest in the cool temperate region. So that's a lot of our West, Western Cape um, province coastline. And the largest overall de decreases are not surprisingly in migratory birds, um, especially migratory waders, which have decreased at about 85% since the 1980s. But that's not to say that there aren't other species that have been affected. At the Berg River Estuary, the resident wazers are also showing a decline in the numbers. And other groups that have undergone major declines include our omnivorous and herbivorous waterfowl, as well as gulls and turds. So the Berg River Estuary is this unique system that deserves that priority protection and restoration. But currently it has no formal protection. And if you look at all the reports and, and uh, actions that come through these reports in the NBA, the National Biodiversity Assessment, all of them say that the Berg River Estuary needs that high level of protection. It needs that protection status. So I'm going to be picking up on that a little bit, a little bit later in terms of what we're doing at the Berg. But before I go there, I'm just gonna to touch on another estuary that um, BirdLife South Africa works at. That's the Klein River Estuary near Hermanus on the south coast. And the Klein is an estuarine lake. Beautiful estuarine lake. It's a massive water body system which is connected to the sea by that constricted inlet channel. And it's about 1400 hectares. And like the Berg, it's ranked within the top 10. It's ranked fifth in the country for its uh, conservation importance. And similarly, it's in particular important for its bird life and for the nursery area of the fish. And unsurprisingly, the major habitat type there is that open water, along with the supertidal salt marsh, the submerged macrophytes, and the weeds and sedges. So the estuarine lakes in South Africa are under a lot of pressure, uh, particularly under pressure from that surrounding development and the activity on the estuary itself, in particular around overfishing, illegal gill netting is a real problem at the claim of the estuary. They suffer from uh, water pollution, so decreased water quality coming into the estuary, as well, of course, as lower water volume as well. So this all affects their ability to actually provide those key ecosystem services that Nikki was talking about, you know, nutrient cycling, nursery habitat, recreation and tourism values, all that stuff that supports local livelihoods as well. And 
the Klein River estuary, like the Berg, has only partial formal protection. And it truly deserves greater protection. And it is one of those estuaries that has been identified for increased formal protection. It supports more than about 200 bird species and about 90% 90, 90 of those are, 90 of those are uh, water birds. And the surrounding vegetation is beautiful Agalis limestone fambos, which is a threatened habitat. And it has intact areas of those milkwood thickets, which are just really, really beautiful and support species like nice and woodpecker. So it's a wonderful system, but like the Berg, it doesn't have any formal protection status. And this is where Bird Life South Africa is really focusing its attention. It's focusing its attention in the Western Cape on those estuaries that don't have formal protection or have partial formal protection. And we're working to see if we can improve that or assist our conservation partners in getting formal protection status for these estuaries. So that's all part of the Western Cape Estuaries Conservation Project. And we take on a number of different actions, but the first one I'm going to speak to is around that protected area, conservation area or biodiversity partnership area expansion on the state and privately owned land. And I know my colleagues have been talking about biodiversity stewardship um, this month, so I'm not going to go into huge detail about what biodiversity stewardship is. Um, some wonderful uh, presentations on YouTube, which can tell you all about our biodiversity stewardship work. But I will move on to, I put a definition in the, in the bottom there. Um, and I will say that uh, BirdLife South Africa's work around biodiversity stewardship began before I actually arrived at BirdLife. Um, where a, part, um, a colleague who's now lived, uh, left BirdLife South Africa, Sam Schroeder, went about declare, declaring the Mutunzuk protected environment, which is the primary catchment area for the Faluran Flare estuary. And I think Sam is actually with us tonight. So this is the kind of work that we now do at the Berg and are going to be doing at the Claim. So we started in the Berg River estuary at, and during this project, the Berg River Conservancy was revitalized. And this conservancy covers about 25, upwards of 25,000 hectares um, and is championed by a dedicated group of farmers in the area. And then we've taken that one step further. And now we're working with individual landowners to actually get increased protection for their particular land. And and at the moment, we have a 7,000 hectare protected environment, which is currently being declared on the north bank of the estuary. And this will include around 1,000 hectares of estuarine floodplain and about uh, 5,000 hectares of intact Fembos area and Strandfelt area, both of which are threatened vegetation types. Um, so it's a really wonderful area, and they have these beautiful inland salt pans which um, attract flamingos in huge numbers when they, when they have um, sufficient water levels. So it's a wonderful system. We do do a great deal of work there. These are the kinds of birds that um, we find in the area. Um, but we work with the landowners around improved grazing around the estuarine edge, around restoring some of the famous habitats, so famous burning regimes, we do alien clearing, um, and also some fun biodiversity monitoring by introducing camera traps in the area and taking a look at what wonderful species they find on their farms. And it's amazing as well, in such an area you drive through there, you don't actually realize just how beautiful the Strandfelt and Fambos vegetation actually is and what absolute um, joys you actually find hidden within this, the, this vegetation type. Um, coming to survey this farm for the first time, um, we found viable populations of critically endangered fangor species um, that were not known to be there before. Um, and some of these are pictured here. Um, truly wonderful makeup of plants as well. And then at the Clane River Airstry, um, we just launched a new project on the south bank of the Airstry. And this is a picture actually taken from one of the properties that we'll be focusing on. And there are more than 2,000 hectares of estuarine habitat and the neighboring Agalas 
uh, limestone fambles, which is a threatened uh, vegetation type as well, is being targeted for protected area expansion. So this project, which we kick-started in May, um, will be finding its legs in the next couple of months, and we hope to see some declarations and formal protection for the south bank of the estuary as well. The other interesting aspect around trying to formally protect our estuaries is that a lot of estuarine land, and that's the land under the water itself, is actually not, it's actually state-owned land. It depends to the Department, National Department of Public Works. So pictured here is the claim of the estuary, and that is the waterway. You can see the blue line of the estuarine functional zone. And then the, the green is actually the unalienated state land. So that's the state-owned land. And then the rest that's not colored in, the clear um, area where you can just see within the blue boundary is actually privately owned land. That's where the property boundaries actually extend halfway into the estuary itself. So we are working with Cape Nature and other organizations to actually get formal protection for what we call the state-owned estuarine land. And pictured here is a map of some of those estuaries that we'll be working on. There's about 10 in total, but you can see it extends all the way from the Olifant River estuary, the Lauren Plain Berg on the west, all the way around to Earl Kraus River estuary, the Claim, and all the way up to um, Kyobund River estuary. So there are a number of different estuaries that we're working on there, and that's, that's a project that we're doing in partnership with um, Cape Nature and other government bodies. But coming to other actions that we are taking, um, Nikki hinted at it, and it's, and it's true. We do a great deal of work on the ground. Obviously, we try to do as much as possible by, putting, um, put, uh, in, by contributing to policy design and support, um, inputting into local bylaws, etc. But um, we do a lot of work around habitat management and rehabilitation as well. And, and typically, uh, an example of this, actually, um, I will speak to you later, apologies. Um, and that will be our, around our erosion control um, estuarine habitat rehabilitation project for the bird. But just a few examples of what we do. So, as, as Nikki said, a lot of the work that you need to do is in the catchment of these estuaries. That's where the influences come from that impact our estuaries, not just the direct influences at the estuary itself. So, we need to, to work in the catchment. And um, I mentioned the Matonza Protected Environment. But we are looking at other uh, protected area and uh, water conservation based initiatives in the catchments of some of our key estuaries in the Western Cape, particularly along the West Coast, which has suffered so much from the recent drought and where the lack of freshwater inflow is a huge factor in, the, in, in influencing the health of our estuary. If you look at the Beluran Clay system, and you can see an example right there of a system that is being deprived of its ground and surface freshwater inflows. So we're working towards water conservation initiatives in the catchments. We are already heavily involved in invasive alien plant clearing in the catchments. We've trained and fund a number of teams, particularly in partnership with West Coast District Municipality, um, an excellent partner in the area. Uh, we do a lot of biodiversity monitoring through camera trapping. And BirdLife South Africa has even pulled together a couple of invasive alien plant management clearing plans. So if you keep track of the invasives being um, cleared, and also that's a great communication tool for when you're working with landers. So you can actually show progress along, along the way to actually clearing a catchment and plan your follow, um, follow up accordingly. Then in the estuary itself, obviously we work a great deal as well around habitat restoration and rehabilitation. Again, with invasives clearing, clearing and also research and monitoring. I'm a huge fan of the coordinated water bird counts. Um, um, they are absolutely necessary for the monitoring of our systems. And I would encourage anyone who um, is involved in CRIC or um, who, who would like to be involved in CRIC to get involved. Those, um, pro those kind of projects and that kind of data is invaluable to the monitoring of our estuarine systems, particularly now with these declines in our water bird numbers. So I said I'd mentioned just one of the 
restoration projects in a little bit more detail, and I'll do so in closing um, before I finish off. Um, so this is a project that's on the go of the Berg. It unfortunately got held up a little last year um, with all our COVID restrictions. But um, this is a project that's funded through the East Atlantic Flyway Initiative, um, for which the Berg River Estuary forms an important site along the route. And essentially what we're looking at here is the erosion at the Berg River Estuary is actually quite serious. And with the drought, unfortunately, those hypersaline conditions that were um, a result of the drought caused a lot of weed marsh die off. So we had a lot of Phragmites die off. And with that lack, lack of bankside cover, um, suddenly the bank is far more exposed to um, wind action, wave action from boats, the disturbance from boats as they fly past. Um, and um, that's accelerated erosion in a lot of places. Also, we've got a, a de degrading salt marsh habitat, which has um, suffered from dumping um, from various, um, well, I won't point any fingers, but it's a lot of dumping onto the, to the salt marsh. There's a lot of trampling of the salt marsh, driving over salt marsh areas. And that, of course, also then degrades the salt marsh and, and causes um, dieback of the salt marsh and increased erosion in areas as well. So this little project that we're doing is a pilot project where we're looking at trialing the soft engineering, environmentally sound erosion control techniques. There's nothing hard engineering in this. Um, and we're looking, this, is, this includes a lot of estuarine habitat restoration as well. So restoring salt marsh, restoring the weed marsh. Um, along with this, we also develop informational and instructional signage to help curb activities that accelerate erosion. So we work a lot in inputting into the bylaws and declaring erosion sensitive areas um, and then putting up signs. And we're also working on the side to establish an estuarine plant nursery so that we can actually grow the plants that we need to use when we actually rehabilitate these bank sites and we plant them into geocells and um, other, um, other uh, types of interventions but we use these plants and you need mature plants to actually be able to do that as well. So we've got that developing on the side. And we do, we, with our on the ground work, and, and this is a project that's an example of it, we focus a great deal on local job creation and training. And this is important in terms of being able to give back to the community as well, and to create those tangible benefits that um, landowners and um, community members can appreciate and take away um, from conservation action in their area. So that's an example of some of the um, on the ground work that we're doing. And um, I would just like to finish off by saying a big thank you, especially to our major, major funders with uh, WWF and um, the Rupert Nature Foundation. And also a big thank you to everyone this evening for tuning in. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Giselle, and a big thank you as well to Nikki. That was a phenomenal and very interesting session. Certainly a lot of hard work going into the conservation of our estuaries. And I'd like to invite both of you to join me now for our question session. But before we dive into that, can I just ask everybody to please be aware that when you exit the webinar tonight, there will be a survey which will come up on your screens. And we would really appreciate it if you do participate in that post webinar survey, it'll only take you two minutes. And you'll see my colleague Andrew posting links to the Virtual African Bird Fair platform when we're done here tonight. Why not consider heading over there and signing up? It is free and you'll get access to a whole lot of amazing and interesting talks. And just a reminder that next week our Sand Park series is back. I can't believe that August is already here. But we will be joined by the amazing Rick Nuttall, and he'll be giving us an incredible overview of the Golden Gate National Park and its incredible birds. So be sure to tune in next week, Tuesday. But let's uh, dive into some amazing questions. And before we do, just a, a comment I see from Sven Kreer of the Bataleurs. Great to have you with us, Sven, and thank you so much for everything that you guys do for our conservation landscape in South Africa. And uh, 
it's great to have you with us. And I see he's uh, volunteering his services, Nikki and Giselle. So I suggest we, we take him up on that. Thank you, Sven. <laughs> but uh, let's kick off. And we've got a question here from Melissa Stradorm. And Nikki, I'm going to point this one your way because I know you have been extensively involved in this and it has been making headlines in the news after the horrific UPL chemical fire we saw north of Durban. And she'd really like to know a little bit around the impact that this fire is potentially having on the bird life as well as some of the other biodiversity within that Umschlange estuary and what's sort of being done to tackle this uh, natural disaster. Thanks, Nikki. Is that Melissa's or Andrea's? Mel uh, Melissa straight on, Nikki. Okay. Okay. She's, she's also asked, is BLSA concerned? And I have chatted with Mark about this, so I can say, yes, BLSA is concerned. And he's asked me to convey that. And there will be a position, um, but we need to chat through some more of what I've been seeing on the ground. Uh, in terms of impact, we are still taking samples from their first observations. There's quite a lot of destruction in terms of animals that have died. There's already been a lot of crayfish and fish that have been picked up on the beaches. Um, our observations on the estuary, and that's mine and, and Tiki's, um, seems to indicate that there's not a lot in the estuary left alive, but we would need to sample to confirm that and be quite sure from a data point of view that that is the situation. So in terms of birds, because I'm sure that would be a concern for people, we have not had a single report of an affected bird during this incident to date. So there's been no acute toxicity that seems to have affected them. We are watching because there might still be chronic effects um, as birds eat more and more of the fish washing up and are possibly exposed to more and more of the toxins. We might expect something like that, but we are keeping an eye on it. And we have got um, David Allen from the museum on standby who will also assist should something like that um, be, be noticed or, or now start coming into being. But for the moment, the birds seem to have been okay. Thanks, Nikki, and thanks for all that you and David and co are doing to keep an eye on the situation. It certainly is a devastating blow to a, a very heavily impacted system. So we wish you all the best as you, you tackle this. And I see uh, just following on from that, we've got the question from Andrea asking how extensive the impact is on aquatic birds and other wildlife, which you've spoken to, but also how effective are the cleanup efforts um, and what's being done to, to sort of tackle that aspect of it? I think I can't say much about that at the moment because it, it really is a work in progress. It hasn't been easy to deal with, particularly given the fact that the fire started on the 12th in the middle of all the unrest. And so firefighters got in there the next day and thereafter it all started unfolding between the 12th and the 15th. So there are extensive teams from Spiltech and Drysit. Drysit are working on site, Spiltech are working around the area. And there is a specialist team of ecologists and hydrogeologists that are all advising and river ecologists, wetland people that are all looking and advising what needs to be done. So I think we'll know more in the coming weeks as we start digging into what's really, what's really been affected and whether the cleanup operations are working. Absolutely, and we wish you and the team all the best with that. I'm going to jump over to the, the West Coast now. So Giselle, if you are there, if you wouldn't mind coming back online. There we go. And uh, this one's from our honorary patron, Pamela Isdar. And Pamela, it's great to have you with us yet again. Thanks so much for all of the support that you give us on the show and to our organization at large. Um, so Giselle, I'm going to let you have the first stab at this, and then I'm going to throw it over to Nikki, who I know has dealt with this extensively in the Isimangaliso system. But uh, Pamela's asking, does dredging have an adverse effect on the estuary? And if so, why dredge the Berg estuary? Giselle, if you wouldn't mind talking to that first, please. Uh, yes, yes. Um, okay. Hi, Pamela. Um, thanks for joining us this evening. Yes, um, the dredging, dredging does have a negative impact um, on the estuary, um, or on estuaries in general. Uh, reduced light penetration uh, by increased turbidity, altered tidal exchange, uh, reduced nutrient outflow to the surrounding wetland areas, um, increased saltwater intrusion, I could go on. Um, at the Berg River estuary, the, 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 the mouth is dredged, um, there's a small harbor there. So it's dredged to keep the mouth open and maintain access 
for the fishing vessels going back and forth. Um, and that was opened up in, I believe, sort of the late 1960s and is maintained to this day. Um, actually, at the Berg, the dredging is actually having a bit of a, an add-on effect, both good and bad. Um, the, the channel is actually deepening um, in the estuary, thanks to being having a, a permanently open mouth. And that means that the estuary is actually almost widening. So the river channel is actually widening. It's trying to spread out to, com to accommodate um, that deeper channel, which is again also cutting away um, at the neighboring estuarine riparian habitat um, and accelerating erosion um, in, in that way. So that, that's a bit of a negative effect, but strangely, a, a bit more of a positive effect um, is by having that estuary open all the time in the recent drought, that continual saline influence actually helped to mix the water within the estuary rather than kind of leaving it as sort of stagnant, unmoving um, pond, you know, when there was no fresh water coming down. So there was a, a positive side to, to having a permanently open mouth. But in general, and I'm sure Nikki will speak to this as well, um, the impacts of dr uh, dredging are, are negative um, in their effect on the estuary functioning. Thanks, Giselle. Nikki, do you want to weigh in on this contentious <laughs> issue, please? <laughs> I was going to say I'd love to, but I mean, I think it was a fantastic question, Pamela. Uh, it is one of the worst things that you can do to an estuary. I'm going to use my advanced age and grey hair to to be a little bit more, a little bit more outspoken than Giselle. I'm also not. Um, I don't have to worry about organisational <laughs> holds or anything else. But dredging was reviewed as across all estuaries internationally. And the statement that leads in that document is that dredging impacts are almost always deleterious in any system. So I think that probably answers your question. Dredging in estuaries should really not be occurring. It has terrible effects on the benthic organisms that live in the, in the bottom sediments. And there are some studies that have shown that after dredging, even 10 years after, those, those animals do not come back. And those are really the pumps that feed everything else within an estuary. So yeah, it doesn't get any votes or support from me. Thanks, Nikki. And uh, yeah, certainly from, we like to follow science here on the show. So science is there and uh, yeah. We'll, we'll leave it at that. But, <laughs> Giselle spoke about uh, erosion impacts in her talk, and I see Alan Bedford Shaw's brought a comment in here, Giselle. So this one's for you. He says, as Berg River regulars, we often see boats speeding up and down the river, throwing up big bow waves and eroding the bank where birds nest and obviously rely on a lot of intact habitat. How can enforcement of these no-wake zones be effectively brought about and what can be done to protect the sensitive estuary habitat? Um, hi, Anne. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> we can have all the laws we want and the no rig zones in place, but if enforcement isn't going to happen, then it's not going to mean much in the end, unfortunately. And that just goes across the board for all our laws and, and, and uh, particularly our recreational bylaws. Um, the good news for the Berg River estuary is that as of last year, um, Cape Nature now has, um, well now they have three marine rangers in place at the Berg River Estuary, which is absolutely phenomenal. So they have um, an actual boat on the river and they are there to enforce the bylaws, which is why we were so keen to get those no wake zones into the bylaws so that they could be enforced and you could find people and that could actually be a takeaway for the, for the marine rangers. So, there the Berg um, system is actually quite fortunate in having that enforcement presence on the water. But where you don't have that, that yeah, it can, be a, it can be a real issue and you always get those crazy people <laughs> speeding down incredibly narrow channels um, and causing all kinds of havoc and disturbance to bird life and to the surrounding estuarine habitat. Absolutely, and then sort of sticking with that recreational reckless recreational activity. Uh, Giselle, we've got a question coming in from the Virtual African Bird Fair platform. And this one's from Ali Mutu. 
And she's saying that Sandpox is looking at kite flying, which may have an impact on bird life at estuaries. And she raised this with them when they were researching Nisner. And she's very glad to see that they have taken note of that. Given your experience with researching recreational disturbances, what impacts do you think something like, like kite flying would pose to our estuaries and the biodiversity they contain? Uh, I have to say I'm a bit anti-kite kite flying, kite surfing. Um, it's right up there with jet skis for me. I just don't think that some estuaries are appropriate for it. Um, a kite surfing is not allowed at the Berg River estuary, for example. It's a, it's a narrow estuary. It doesn't have large areas of open water. Um, it, it's just not appropriate to, for, for the estuary. Um, I actually did a little bit of a, a, a study on kites, kite surfing and, and, and uh, kiting in general, actually, and the impacts of, on uh, water birds. And unfortunately, there is actually very little in the way of scientific literature on the subject. Um, the science that is there doesn't seem to um, distinguish between the different stages of disturbance. So if somebody's just walking along the shoreline um, or they're putting their kite together in one spot and then they're launching the kite, so they don't tend to distinguish as much. But the, from the information that is out there, it's very obvious, though there does seem to be a very obvious uh, reaction from birds, particularly in the waterfowl and from your wading, wading bird populations to the presence of the kite. Um, it seems to be something to do with the erratic movement of the kite. Um, it's, and also the, um, it's not a regular disturbance presence. It, it, so it's not something that, any, it, there doesn't seem to be any kind of habituation by the birds as well. And also the presence of kite surfing actually extends not just on the water, but in the surrounding habitat as well. So you've birds breeding in the dunes, or in the neighboring salt marsh, or etc., we'll see this kite flying over. Some say they identify it as a raptor type figure and they respond accordingly. But whatever the range of behaviors have, that have been observed, there is always some kind of reaction, um, whether it's just alert behavior all the way up to birds actually leaving that area and not actually returning um, until, or not actually returning sometimes, but certainly not returning with while the, the, the kites are still there and not returning for a good while afterwards as well. So you're talking about habitat displacement, energy costs, and potentially a loss of habitat in the end. So we do need to see more scientific research on the subject, but um, the indications are that it does have a negative impact and should not be appropriate to certain histories. Absolutely, and I think that sort of move towards responsible recreational activities is something we're seeing more and more in all sectors. Uh, I had a very interesting chat with Chris Packham and Martin Harper around ethical AV tourism and, and how we go about offsetting carbon and that sort of thing. And I think more and more we as humans with our getting out into nature activities are starting to realize that even though we are promoting nature conservation by being out there, we do have an impact and we need to try and figure out how best to to mitigate that. And I think that could be the topic for a whole nother conservation <laughs> conversation. So before we, we go down that rabbit hole, I think I'm gonna finish us off with one last question and I'm gonna put this one to Nicolette. I see we are running over time slightly. So apologies everyone, but I think this has been really interesting discussion. So I don't wanna cut us too short. Um, Nikki, this one's from Penny Abbott and she asks, what are the main changes in agricultural practices which will help improve the water quality downstream? So if you wouldn't mind weighing in on that, please. Okay, um, that's that's quite a, a big topic. But I, I think from what we see, particularly on the KZN coast with um, sugarcane cultivation, one of the things that we, we don't see on the ground is any space for the rivers, the streams, the tributaries going into the estuaries, which means that um, you have the farm activity interfacing directly with the, the water and the stream area, which means you get sedimentation, nutrients directly into those systems. So having a buffer, having space, having a, a proper riparian zone, which acts as a shield for those water bodies would be a huge step towards um, making a difference to the inflowing water to estuaries. And in our case, some of our estuarine functional zones even have cultivation within them. So it's not, it's not even upstream of the estuary, it's actually within the estuary. And we have 
estuary boundaries that go up to about five meters above mean sea level topographically. And we have farms that come down to one meter above mean sea level. So they are literally underneath the high water mark. I mean, the high tide mark. So a high spring tide, if it was getting in there, would actually inundate some of those areas. So it's often prevents it because of the type of estuary it's on. So that doesn't become an issue. But any estuary that then closes and starts back flooding actually starts moving into some of those agricultural lands. And that will pick up the pesticides, the herbicides, the fertilizers, everything else that is, is being used on those lands. So you can imagine that giving it space would make a huge difference. Absolutely, yeah. I suppose being at the tail end of these catchments, everything that goes on within that catchment has a massive impact at the, the end of the line in our estuaries. And I can only commend the two of you for the incredible amount of work that you're doing to try and protect these important systems and the biodiversity that we find there. There are so many more questions to tackle and I'm afraid we really have run out of time tonight. But what I'll do is share those questions with both of you. And if you have the time to just get back to the relevant individuals, I'm sure they'd really appreciate that. And you'll see in the comment feed how many people have thoroughly enjoyed tonight, as have I. There's been a massive amount of information, but really, really interesting. And thank you both for the incredible amount of time and effort that you've put into tonight's talk. I'm going to give you both a chance just to give us some closing sentiments before we part. So I'll start with Nikki, and then we can finish off with Giselle, please. I just want to say thank you to BirdLife South Africa, South Africa for giving us the opportunity to speak about things we love so much. And I want to encourage people to get to know their local estuaries. Go down and explore, and I think they will amaze you. And you'll often find us at one of them, and we're always happy to talk and teach. <laughs> and if you're going to be somewhere where we are, contact us, and we will come and, and show you what we know. Thank you, Nikki. Giselle? No, absolutely. I'll second that, um, Nikki. I'll say um, thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. And thank you to Nikki for joining me. Um, I really appreciate your joining us. Your expertise in the area are unsurpassed, really. So, um, and yeah, absolutely. And if you're out in the Western Cape for our estuaries and you have any questions about them, please don't hesitate to contact. And I would encourage everyone as well to get involved in the citizen science projects like Coordinated Waterbird Count if, you, if you're local to an estuary. Um, the data we receive from those is it's really invaluable to, to our understanding of all the bird um, numbers and abundance and trends in those. So I do encourage you to get involved in that. And I will do my best to answer any questions that um, we haven't got to this evening. Thank you both so Can much. I, and, oh, sorry, Nikki, go for it. Sorry. Can mm. I add one thing? Because the two of us have, have kind of left out the the middle section of coast where most of the Eastern Cape histories <laughs> are. Yes. And if people are here, I, I want to reassure them that they haven't been forgotten. There's about to be a very large classification study started between George and the Imtambuna, which is the last estuary in KZN. And so they should watch out for that because they can get involved and participate and provide information on their local estuaries if they know about it. And I'm going to be part of that project. So I look forward to meeting some of the Eastern Cape people. Absolutely. And thank you, Nikki. Yes, we, uh, we often do overlook the poor Eastern Cape. So it's wonderful <laughs> to see that that is, uh, is getting some attention. And hopefully one day we can bring the Eastern Cape contingent onto the show to do a follow up and, and see what they've discovered down there. So thank you for mentioning that. And just before I let you both go, Giselle, you mentioned the citizen science aspect. I see a number of people asking how they go about getting involved in something like Quack is the best path to sort of reach out to your local bird clubs or how does one go about getting involved in that? Well, the quack um, coordinators are very often involved in your local bird club. So they probably do have um, uh, the name of the person who's coordinating the, the local quacks. Um, if not, you know, you can reach out through the University of Cape Town through someone like Sanjo Rose, who can put you in touch with the coordinator for a particular for a particular water body. It doesn't have to be an estuary, but um, for the particular estuary body as well. Um, and of course, in the Western Cape, if anybody's out there, you're more than welcome to contact me. I, I'm I'm pretty familiar with pretty much everybody who does cracks <laughs> in our, in the Western Cape. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, on that awesome note, ladies, I'd like to thank you both. This was a brilliant conservation conversations, and I'm sure lots of people are now 
more aware of their estuaries. So thank you both for sharing your passion and your knowledge and keep up the incredible work that you are both doing to safeguard these wonderful systems. With that, everyone, join us on Friday. It's Virtual African Bird Fair. It's going to be a blast. If you enjoy these conservation conversation sessions, Virtual African Bird Fair is conservation conversations on steroids. So come join us. <laughs> have some fun. It's freezing cold outside if you're in South Africa. So come join us virtually and stay warm. And we look forward to hosting you then. Andrew will be back on Tuesday with our Sand Park series lecture. So do tune in for that, Golden Gates Highland National Park. And other than that, we will see you again, same time, same place, next week, Tuesday. Keep your eyes on the skies and keep enjoying those birds. Good night, everybody, and stay safe.